no other country has ever done, which is, which is some people say, turning the declaration into Canadian law. Tonight, still before the Senate, the year-long battle over Canadian law and the UN Declaration on Indigenous Rights. Meanwhile, Conservative senators are worried. I was affected, as so many people were across the country, by what happened. A Saskatchewan filmmaker has a new production she hopes will help a new generation stand up. The goal for this organization is for Inuit to be known and in the city because there's no Inuit-centric services. And Inuit people in Winnipeg now have a place they can call their own. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. The Senate Committee on Aboriginal Peoples began to finally study Bill C-262 today. It's a private member's bill sponsored by NDP MP Romeo Saganash. It aims to review Canada's past and future laws so they're in line with the UN Declaration on Indigenous Rights. However, C-262 has been sitting in the Senate for a year now. And as Todd Lamoran reports, Conservative senators have concerns. Conservative Senator Scott Tanis tells MP Romeo Saganash he hopes they can work together on Bill C-262. But Tanis and the other Conservative senators question how much impact the legislation will have. You're, you're telling us this is an innocuous bill. Uh, it's just about reviewing Cana Canadian Canada statutes. But Section 3 says application with application in Canadian law. Can you just, like, what does that phrase mean? We're making sure that uh, all of our laws uh, for the coming years stemming out of the Parliament of Canada uh, are consistent with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Senator Tanis still wants clarification on what C-262 will do to Canadian law. That no other country has ever done, which is, which is some people say, turning the declaration into Canadian law, which then be subject to all kinds of different interpretations. If that's the case, we need to know that. Tanis doesn't know C-262 will ensure that future court battles and economic disruption can be avoided. And I'm not convinced we're there yet, but I and others are going to work hard to make sure that by the time these hearings are done, we've got a good handle on the facts. Saganash questions how much more information Conservative Senators need. The House Committee on Indigenous People studied the bill in a dozen meetings. Uh, over 70 witnesses uh, uh, that came, uh, experts, uh, uh, leaders and so on and so forth. I think uh, the study of this bill has, has happened. Saganash stressed the bill needs to be passed before the end of June. I am also uh, troubled by the fact that uh, in 2019 uh, in this place called Canada there are still some that are hesitant about the human rights of the first peoples of this country. The committee next meets on C262 tomorrow evening. Two additional meetings have yet to be scheduled. Paul Lamoran, APTN National News, Ottawa. The spring sitting of the Nunavut Legislative Assembly began today and the first order of business was selecting a new speaker. The previous speaker, Joe Enoch of Pawn Inlet, died from cancer in March. First, they began with a moment of silence for Speaker Enoch. Four members were nominated, but Baker Lake's Simeon Makingwa won on the first ballot, getting more than half of the 21 secret ballots. With my colleagues, I know we will work closely together and uh, as supporters for Honourable Speaker, I, I appreciate your uh, votes and I feel uh, thank you very much. It's exciting news for the Inuit community in Winnipeg. The city's first Inuit Resource Centre has officially opened its doors. Ashley Branson toured the facility and has more. This centre is the first of its kind in Western Canada. In early May, Tungasawit Inuit Resource Centre opened its doors. Maxine Angu, the Inuit Outreach Coordinator, says this space was created to help the more than 500 Inuit who live in the Winnipeg area. The goal for this organization is for Inuit to be known and in the city because there's no Inuit-centric services. You walk into any 
indigenous places to get help or any resources. It's First Nations or Métis. You walk into the buildings and there's no Inuit art. There's no Inuktitut speaking people. Even though the doors have only been open for a couple of weeks, the place has been busy. All the time Inuit come and they're just thankful. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad this is happening. And uh, I don't know, it's just, it's, it feels like it was a long time coming for this to happen, right? Steve Massey is one of the co-owners of the new center. He says about two years ago, several Inuit in the city approached him to help them start a frontline service organization for Winnipeg's urban Inuit. I get goosebumps, you know, it's, you know, the, and I get choked up talking about it because, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time and that we've needed it for a long time. The group applied for federal funding in 2018 and that money started to flow earlier this year. The centre offers a common area where visitors can relax, watch TV and use computers. The centre also has a children's playroom that features Inuktitut art, books and word searches. Angu says the community's positive response to the centre's opening, they're hoping to expand their services. So we're going to be offering Inuktitut classes. Uh, so we'll have sewing groups, we'll have carvers, we're going to make traditional Inuit tools. Judy Cappy is from Rankin Inlet, Nunavut, and has been in Winnipeg for nine years. She's a frequent visitor of the centre and says it's wonderful she's able to speak with other Inuit. Speaking our language, it's a lot easier and more comfortable and more understanding with other language. Like it's hard to communicate with them because we don't understand each other. So I can't associate with them when they speak their language. They also can't associate with us because they, they don't understand our language either. So it's kind of hard. Currently, the centre is looking for household donations to help Inuit families in need. For more details about the centre, you can check out its website at tungasuit.ca. Ashley Branson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Time to step aside for a quick break and then we're off to visit a camp on Doing First Nation. Here's a look at Wednesday's weather forecast starting on the east coast. Showers and a high of 12 for St. John's, sunny and 14 in Charlottetown. Showers and 4 for Nain and Cartwright, rain and 9 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Sunny skies and 21 for Montreal, sunny and 19 for Quebec City. 19 under the sun in Ottawa, Peterborough, North Bay and Sault Ste. Marie. 24 and sunny skies for Thunder Bay, sunny and 22 in Sioux Lookout. A chance of snow and plus one in Churchill, 18 for Norway House and God's Lake. 28 in Winnipeg, 31 for Dauphin, 29 in Brandon. 30 for Saskatoon and North Battleford, 28 in Yorkton. 31 in Meadow Lake, 15 in Stony Rapids. Welcome back. For Doig River First Nation in northern British Columbia, an annual camp is more than a place to gather. It's about continuing a tradition that has been going on for centuries. APTN's Tamara Pimentel spent the weekend on the land with the Beaver people. This is Kema, a pure place in nature and an ancient place where the ancestors of the beaver people camped and hunted. For as long as anyone could remember, friends and family of the Doig River First Nation in northern British Columbia carried on that tradition. For four days, once a year, they camp in the very spot their ancestors did. It's, impor it's important that we learn this because once it's gone, it can never be retaught or brought back. 13-year-old so, Tristan Johnson says yeah. he learned how to skin beaver three years ago using traditional tools made from deer or elk bone. Like, this is our roots, this is like where we came from, this is where we will stay, this is like, this is our life. Hunting, trapping and skinning is just a few of many things youth learn at this camp. Down the road, Ernie Napoleon teaches these teens how to set beaver traps. They've just got to learn something that that we learned in the past, and then in the, in the future, we won't be around all the time. So 
They got to look up the things that they learned. Using shaved willow as bait, the trap is set in the beaver's path. Shave the bait and then uh, put it behind the trap. And you put a bunch of sticks on it so the beaver can't go around. Napoleon says it's important for the youth to learn these skills for the future. That's their livelihood. There's going to be hard times yet. No doubt about that. It's just not going to be easy. And right now they don't know too much about things like this. And uh, it's time to learn. Back at the camp, youth gather around to listen to elders' stories. While some practice archery, there's no internet to distract them. Johnson says it's a nice break from today's technology and social media. Well, so much kids are like used to like being on their phones and like they don't know how important it is that how strong and tight we are to tradition and how important it is to us. And it makes us who we are and it makes us pure. This and it makes us indigenous Aboriginal peoples. Tamir Pimentel, APTN National News, Doeg River, First Nation. A film about the shooting death of Colton Bushy and his family's experience with the Saskatchewan justice system began its national theatrical tour in Saskatoon on May 23rd. The documentary Nipo Samasoan We Will Stand Up will tour across Canada. Tasha alive. Hubbard, the director and producer, says it was important to kick off this tour in Saskatchewan because this is where the shooting and trial happened. Colton Bushy was 22 when he was fatally shot on a rural Saskatchewan farm in 2016. The farmer stood trial for second-degree murder. He was later acquitted. Hubbard says the film presents a perspective that's been hidden over generations. I was affected, as so many people were across the country, by what happened. And I was thinking about it in terms of the past and, and some of the history of this area. And I was also thinking about it in terms of the future and what this was going to mean for coming generations of Indigenous people, you know, in terms of being on our own territories, you know, being safe to move through those territories. And, you know, I think what this case showed is, is, the, is the deep attitudes that, that are held. Coming up, a feature interview with actor and director Lauren Cardinal. Stick around. I'm Angel Moore, two kilometers below the surface of Sudbury, Ontario, in one of the deepest laboratories in the world. Fifteen lucky Mi'kmaq students from Nova Scotia got a tour of the Snow Lab research facility. They are the first Indigenous student group to see where scientists study neutrinos and dark matter. The student summer program is to inspire youth. To keep on going with science, because with science, you can do so much for the world and we can, save, we can save the planet. Watch for the story on APTN National News. Here's the rest of Wednesday's weather forecast, picking back up in uh, smoky northern Alberta, 31 for Peace River, 27 in high level. Sunny skies and 29 for Red Deer and Medicine Hat, 32 in Edmonton. Sunny and 19 in Victoria, rain and 20 for Vancouver. 25 in Fort Nelson and Prince George, 24 for Smithers. 13 with rain for Old Crow, 18 and showers in Whitehorse. 24 above for Fort Liard and Trout Lake, rain and 8 for Yellowknife. Plus 1 in Saks Harbor, 0 for Politak. 3 and snow for Baker Lake, Whale Cove and Repulse Bay, snow and one in Chesterfield. Two in Clyde River, zero with snow in Resolute. Welcome back. Acclaimed actor Lauren Cardinal, known for his roles on Corner Gas and North of 60, was in Winnipeg recently, addressing crowds as a keynote speaker at the annual Vision Quest conference. APTN met with Cardinal to discuss the important message she chose to convey. Lindsay Richardson has more. Okay, well, Lauren, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. So for people that aren't familiar with Vision Quest, it's obviously a multi-day conference that brings together Indigenous youth and artists and entrepreneurs. So with that in mind, what topics did you think were most important to cover during your keynote speech today? Uh, for me, my... Uh, 
important message I try to get across to the youth is about conquering fear and, uh, and being curious and the importance of education. And uh, I just uh, share stories with how I got to be where I am and a lot of that was by asking questions and being curious and not taking no for an answer. And also, especially here, I think it's important for people, especially our youth, to be able to, to get over the shyness. I mean, shyness is good when you're being polite about it, but when it starts debilitating you from uh, talking to somebody, a potential employer or a potential business partner, then it becomes a problem. Then you're co creating a problem for yourself. So it's important to, to put the shyness aside and be able to stand up proud and tall and say, hey, I'm so-and-so from so-and-so. And, and that only comes with self-confidence. Now, as an actor, when you were first starting out, how did you surmount those obstacles? A lot of training, because I was the uh, I was the, the shy brown child in class when <laughs> when I was there, and it was uh, it was terrifying. The first time I public spoke in grade three, I, I passed out, and then when I tried it in seven, grade seven, I threw up. So <laughs> I've had a little love hate thing with uh, speaking in public, but the way uh, I've learned over the course of the years is, is uh, through my acting training, through breathing, learning how to channel that nervous energy into positive energy, using that energy to, to drive your ideas forward and through and stuff. So it takes a bit of training, but it's, it's my, my foot still shakes and my hand still like when I'm backstage, but then I take a breath and go, okay, here we go. And keep going. Yeah. So now as a seasoned actor, one of the things that you did mention today was breaking through the white ceiling. Now, mm -hmm. could you explain a little bit more about what this means or how people can go about it? Yeah, I mean, when I started in, in theater, uh, out of theater school, um, it was, it still is, but it's changing slowly. Uh, but there was still a lot of the attitude of, uh, I could only audition or read for native parts because uh, you know I'd go approach an artistic director to say hey I want to audition for you but we're not doing any native theater plays this year I was like huh I just spent four years in university learning how to do Shakespeare and Bertolt Brecht and you know Eugene O'Neill and uh, I'm pretty sure I can play more than just a, a native guy so that a attitude is changing slowly but it is changing and the more that we have trained uh, indigenous people in schools, in theater schools, or in uh, in uh, technical schools, you know, learning learning all that stuff. It's uh <laughs> now. I'm curious, how has your onset experiences changed when you've been on working as an actor versus working as a director? Have you found that there's a different approach? Um, yeah, I, I have a d different approaches to both jobs because they're both different. Um, onset, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm more, I'm there to, to help tell the story that we're doing. So I, I bring all the skills that I have and try and put it into the work and working off other people. That's very important, but also understanding how the camera works, how the lighting works, where the best place to stand is. And that comes from experience and watching pros. I mean, that's uh, the reason I, I get better is because I'm working with pros and I watch them like a hawk when I'm on set. Mm -hmm. I watch what they do, you know, I get to work with uh, somebody like Al Pacino and as soon as he's on set I watch the monitor to see exactly what he does and he's a master. So I'm, it's like going to film school but they're paying me. <laughs> so I get to watch these guys, you know, I've, and I've worked with a lot of uh, A-list uh, actors and, and all of them are the same. They're very dedicated to their craft, they're shy. Uh, when they're not in their character, and uh, and they're just dedicated to the craft of acting, so they understand what everything does. So I just watch that and and say, oh, okay, I just become a sponge. Good. And then when I'm when I'm directing, I I, 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 I there's a different persona that uh, I kick into. I'm not the smiley, happy actor who's just. Red. I I tend to uh, put on my rugby hat. <laughs> what I learned playing rugby is when you're the captain of a team. You gotta have a certain attitude. You have to drive. You have to know all the answers that anybody asks. See, when you're an actor, you can say, "I don't know." That's a perfectly acceptable answer. But when you're a director in charge of things and you say, "I don't know," that's a sign of a troubled ship. And the people who are most worried are the crew. <laughs> They're going, "Oh, great, we're gonna have 15-hour day because this guy doesn't know what he's doing." Do you find that you're approached differently by your peers when you're working as a director versus as an actor? I think everyone can sense when I'm in, when I'm in a serious focus mode. They tend to, to wait until moments arise when I'm not focused on something that needs doing or needs planning about for the next thing. Because when you're directing, you need to think a couple of shots ahead of what, what you're shooting now. 
so you can get people working so when this scene's over we can move over to the other one it'll be partially lit or all lit and ready to go because they had their their plans given to them you need to do this because we're going to move over there so this has to be ready and then and then it just makes for a quicker day and people go oh okay he knows what he's doing and they work you know, if you work with a great crew, they bend over backwards and give you their knowledge and their expertise, which makes you look even smarter. <laughs> well, speaking of sort of unique career experiences, as I understand it, you were part of a pretty cool production of Shakespeare's The Tempest yes. last month. Would you mind just telling us a little bit more about what that experience was like? Yes, it's the first time uh, that I uh, uh, ever had the opportunity to work with deaf actors. So it was a, it was a, our cast was made of half deaf and half hearing actors. And uh, we were uh, three months in, we did a month training in Banff to learn how to work with each other, to learn about each other. Because the deaf culture is a culture. They have had their own experiences, they have their own history, stuff that I didn't even know. So I was learning from my colleagues all about this, their experience. And then what I found out was that their experience paralleled our experience, the indigenous experience, in the fact that they were both institutionalized, mm -hmm. they were both abused, they were taken away from their families, they had all the same horrific things that happened to them as to us. So that was a, a connector that I went, oh, okay, so uh, un understanding when they, uh, if a deaf person is, is going to ask you something, they're very blunt and straightforward about it. But that's the only way they know how. They don't know about the nuance of, oh, you know, th they don't have that advantage of uh, hearing a, a language or a tone or something. They just go straight and it strikes us hearing people as, oh, they're so blunt and straightforward, but to them it's normal. Mm -hmm. That's how you get your uh, message across. So we did uh, uh, an adapted version of The Tempest, and we focused mainly on the, uh, on the, uh, the revenge aspect of Prospero's journey. Mm -hmm. So we really uplifted that, why he was on the island, why he was deserted, how that happened, and then the people that he shipwrecks himself were all the people responsible for him being there in the first place. And then he gets crazy with uh, revenge and stuff and ends up killing his own daughter. Mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, it was, and, and, and our, we did very physical work, very physical training, Suzuki training, which is a lot of grounded work, a lot of stomping on the ground, and you walk around, your upper body is totally stiff, and your, your feet are pounding into the ground, right? It really centers you. And we worked at becoming a dynamic ensemble, which means that you depend on every, each and every single one has a part. The ensemble is more important than the individual. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of training to get into that mindset. So something happened on stage, you didn't panic. You knew somebody around you would pick up something mm -hmm. or would back you up or jump in with a line if you forget it. You know, you just had no fear about that because we've trained so well together. So it was just, it's a, an experience I'll bring forward uh, to the rest of my work and the rest of my life. So. Sounds exciting and challenging. Mm -hmm. So what's next for you? Uh, I'm going to be doing a little bit of CBC debaters and then I'm uh, going to go do some, uh, some pitching for some ideas at the BAMP Media Television Festival. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, I've got a few irons in the fire for some films and stuff, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Looking forward to see yeah. whatever you're going to put out. Well, thank okay. you again for joining us today. We really appreciate the My time. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Lidson. Well, that's your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. Now stick around. An all-new episode of The Laughing Drum with Tim Fontaine is next. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.